Peter, I started out as a brain scientist and have been fascinated my entire life uh, about the similarities of concepts that exist through all levels of science. And I was very moved by your book in which you discuss symmetry and beauty and showing the importance of that in science. Yeah. Why is symmetry so important? Well, everyone's got a gut feeling that it's important. Mm -hmm. and I, I think it's important to, to try to explore why it is. And if you dig right down into the substructure of the world, then you find what is effectively beauty, but we call it symmetry. Um, that you find that you can talk about the fundamental particles in terms of their symmetries, that you can talk in terms of the forces between the particles in, in terms of the symmetries and so on. So this gut feeling that scientists have that everything is deep down extraordinarily beautiful as expressed by it being symmetrical. Of course, people disagree that beauty is always symmetry, but let's pretend that they're the same for the, for the time being. Mm -hmm. Then I think you, um, it is very gratifying to see that, you know, symmetry is, is turning out to be, um, the key to understanding so many fundamental things. And as you, uh, as, as you work up through the, systems of the world as you move away from the fundamental particles and you come to you know, the properties of matter, you then find that you can discuss, say, the chemistry in terms of symmetry. You can discuss you know, that icon of chemistry, the periodic table, mm. in terms of symmetry. And then you can sort of take it even further and you can start to talk about the the symmetry of biological entities that emerge from all this um, sort of underlying structure and find that symmetry lies there as well. I suppose at its crudest, um, nature decided that it was more economical to think of one half and, <laughs> and let the other one, let the other half just tag along. <laughs> so, um, but you know, we, so biological systems have Symmetry, largely, I think, um, well, I'm not really quite sure why biological systems have a great deal of symmetry. I, obviously, it's, um, it's an evolutionary pressure that, um, uh, that, that, um, you need two legs, obviously, and it's best not to have a body that is overweight on one <laughs> side because you'll be falling over. So, so symmetry is, um, uh, emerges un, un, under natural selection in a way. It emerges because I suppose a synonym for symmetry is, um, simplicity. Mm. And if you go for the simplest route, uh, then you, really go for the symmetrical route, that you know, there's less to plan if you just think of one module that can be replicated a number of times. Let's look at some examples, and let's start at the most basic level of fundamental particles or forces. Uh, what, what are some specific ways that symmetry works at the most fundamental level? Yeah. Well, I suppose if you go back and think in the 19th century of Michael Faraday mm. beavering away in the Royal Institution in, in London and seeing on the one hand electricity and on the other hand magnetism mm. and knowing in, in his heart that these two must be related yeah. because the experiments he was doing showed that he could generate magnetism from electricity and that he could use magnetism to generate electricity. Mm. So mm. he knew that they were uh, almost Siamese twins, but he couldn't really put his finger on the you know, exact connection and um, really, the um, the important step was taken by uh, by Maxwell, who could think in a rather more abstract way than Faraday. Faraday was uh, essentially just a peasant, sort of labouring in the field and uh, doing fantastic agriculture, <laughs> <laughs> and digging up and planting seeds of the you know, most amazing kind. But he had no mathematical skills to speak of, and I suppose that is equivalent to saying that he could not think in a very abstract way. But um, a, a theoretical physicist uh, like Maxwell could take a more abstract view of, of what Faraday was discovering. And 
I, I, I like to think of um, the, the following analogy, that if you think of a square, I'm just looking at a square, and then you think of a hexagon, mm. and you just think of a hexagon. And Faraday's problem was really to see how the square was related to, to the right. hexagon. What Maxwell could do was to was to, to stand back and to think not of a square or a, or a hexagon, but a cube. Mm. And then when you look face on to the cube, then of course you see a square. And if you look down the but body diagonal from one corner to the opposite corner, then what you see, if you shut one eye basically, okay. is, is, um, is a hexagon. And so what Maxwell was able to do is to show that you could take a square, that is this view of the cube, and rotate the cube and see it evolve into a, into, into a hexagon. And so the, what, what he effectively done, did was to show that electricity, the square, and magnetism, the hexagon, were just two abstra- abs- ab- aspects of a single entity, the cube. And so he found the symmetry that related the two forces that Faraday had shown experimentally were related. And then he put those into a, a and very... You expressed those mathematically, yes. A very simple equation. He, well, yeah, if you call them simple. Yeah. Well, I, suppose. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I suppose um, yes, symmetry is, uh, as I said, an aspect of simplicity. And you know, we scientists are hewers of simplicity from complexity and and symmetry gives us um, a clue to the direction we should be thinking um, and when when um, people like um, Dirac for example say that it must be right because <laughs> the equation is so beautiful I think what they're even saying even if the experiment doesn't agree oh never mind the experiment I mean, <laughs> this can be dealt with later <laughs> um, but um, but if, if, if you know that, if you think that you have got a very symmetrical structure in your equations, um, you know, it just feels right. You know, your, your, your heart warms to the equation. That's why the string theorists today are so uh, excited. Gung-ho. They're so yeah. gung-ho about e- it. Even yeah. though they don't have experimental no, data. They never will, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they, but, but they believe because it's so beautiful. That they, yeah, it can't be wrong. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, of course, it can be. It can be, right, right, right. Utterly right, wrong. Right, 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 right. I mean, the important thing in science is never to let go of the connection between observation, sure. experiment, sure. And, and, and mathematics. Sure, but I appreciate that but, emotion. But, but the, the emotion of seeing this um, this gorgeous symmetry. I mean, this gorgeous, it, it really is a visceral feeling of, of beauty. Yeah. And the amazing thing about symmetry, of course, is that it's not just a woolly pro- concept mm. of, ah, oh, that's nice. It really is something that can be rendered quantitative and expressed numerically. And once you start attaching numbers to things, then you have a real grip on, on their properties. So... T- take us to the um, uh, the uh, uh, to chemistry and to the periodic table, and mm. how do, how does symmetry then express itself at this next level? Yeah, um, uh, well, of course, Mendeleev, when when he developed his um, periodic table, hadn't got a clue about why the the, the elements lay in the, the pattern that that they do, and indeed he only had a few dozen elements anyway, yeah. so he was rather clever that he saw the pattern. Um, but um, w- what you have to, to think about is why ordinary matter, you know, carbon, iron, you know, oxygen, and so on, things that are tangible and quite different to the casual eye, actually um, do lie in families. You know, what, how can um, a piece of sodium have a family relationship with a piece of potassium and so on. Why is carbon in the, in the same family as silicon? I mean, this is, when you think about it, you stand back and think, why is tangible matter uh, related? Uh, why, why are there these families? And Mendeleev simply hadn't got a clue. And we had to wait until the um, development of quantum theory and the an understanding of the structure of atoms. And atoms 
really, um, the whole structure of an atom is a kind of manifestation of of symmetry at a whole variety of levels. Mm. There is, of course, at the deepest level of all, the fact that the electron is bound to the nucleus by electromagnetic force. So once again, you've got that uh, symmetry of um, accounting for the interaction between fundamental particles. But the way that um, electrons are arranged around a nucleus, I mean, the way that um, the the electronic structure of, of an atom also depends intimately on on the the symmetry of the um, of of the Schrodinger equation, I suppose you could put it that way, really. But um, and the fact that the the elements have personalities, which is really what the yeah. periodic table is yeah. talking about, is you can trace it to the um, fact that not all the electrons can occupy the lowest state, lowest energy state. So rather amazingly, um, you take a nucleus and you put electrons around it. They don't all collapse into the lowest possible energy level. They're held away from it by an aspect of symmetry because there's this highly enigmatic, and no one really understands it, at least I don't, <laughs> um, principle, the Pauli principle, which says that... The, exclusion. Uh, uh, people call it the Pauli exclusion principle, but it's not quite the same thing. There, is, uh, there are two levels. There is the Pauli principle, which is what I'm talking about, and a consequence of that is the Pauli exclusion principle. So you really have... I'm going okay. to a slightly lower level, which says that... Um, the wave functions that describe the arrangement of electrons in atoms has to have a certain symmetry in the sense that it's a rather abstract symmetry, but you know, abstraction means power <laughs> in this game. Um, that if you change the locations effectively of two electrons, then the wave function must change sign. I mean, all wave functions must do that. Somehow or other, nature is like that. Um, and because of that requirement, that very deep symmetry that the wave function must satisfy, um, there comes the Pauli exclusion principle, which says that no two electrons can be in the same state. And as a consequence of that, they can't all tumble down into the nucleus. They fit into shells that surround the nucleus. And this successive filling of shells gives the elements their personalities. So you know, chemistry, therefore, is a manifestation of symmetry at a whole variety of levels. And that causes the, in a sense, the illusion, but the reality that, that things are solid when things are really not solid. No, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> everything is empty space, really. And it's, <laughs> right, right. and it's quite extraordinary that yeah. you and I can sit here. And or just that we just don't fall through the fall chair. Through the floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But and that's it, it, a result similar, of that it's, same it, it, electronic... It, it, it's, the Pauli principle. it's the Pauli principle that is stopping us blending into a kind of global goo. Which, uh, <laughs> yeah. So you could say that um, in a rather sort of highfalutin sense, in a way, that um, the fact that entities exist... The fact that a baseball exists, the fact that, uh, you know, that, that a baseball stadium exists is really due to symmetry, uh, the, because it's the Pauli exclusion principle, under that the Pauli principle, that gives um, identity to objects. It gives them effectively a boundary so that we can see the baseball. It just doesn't blend into the bat when you hit it. <laughs> yeah. it it's just but. astounding to see that same principle operating at different levels and, and, and in an integrated way. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's very satisfying. I and mean, it's not just astounding. I mean, science is a mixture of mm. satisfaction and astonishment. Mm. <laughs> and and I, I think that um, the gut feeling that you know, things are at root, simple, beautiful, and symmetrical is very satisfying. But of course, 
that's not quite true in the, if you look at things in a more global way, because we know that the universe is apparently not completely symmetrical. You know, you, 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 there, there's not sort of time invariance in, in, in the universe and so on. So there are broken symmetries, and it's the one of the, I suppose, the pleasures of the the world. And I suppose if you were to um, take it to extreme, the very fact of existence is that symmetries are not exact, they're slightly broken. Well, that's great art. It's great, great art. art, absolutely. Great yeah. art, if it was perfectly right. symmetrical, would be boring and childish. It's the, it's the yeah. creativity. It's the nuances. Yeah, the nuances, the nuances, nuances and the breaking yeah. of the symmetries in yes. different ways. And indeed, a uh, periodic table, once again, you could look at it as a, a slight breaking of these symmetries due to the fact that electrons interact with each other. So it's not quite as symmetrical as you mm. might have thought. And, and so and it's that nuanced, broken symmetry that actually gives the richness of the material world.